Pierre Dupont founded this wonderful place way back when. It's been open to the public since 1957. 50 million people have gone through the turnstiles here. The floral displays are magnificent. They just put in a brand new updated fountain system. And yes, yes, it's Longwood Gardens. My name's Ken Kedrowski, and you're on location. You don't know how much I want to tell you that we're sitting in my backyard right now, enjoying the greenery. I would like to tell you that lie. Unfortunately, I can't. We're at Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and I've been here as a guest so many times, but I got to come in the back door to see the secret entrance and everything else, like where the seeds are delivered and the bulbs, and it's really amazing. So we're here in the conservatory, and as you can tell from uh, what you see behind me and, and uh, the scenes that you'll see as I'm talking here, it's just a magnificent place. If you've been to Longwood Gardens, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't been to Longwood Gardens, then I think by the time we do this show that you're going to want to get in the car, uh, drive up uh, Route 1 if that's appropriate for you, and get over here and see everything that Mother Nature has to offer. Right now, the gentleman sitting right next to me is Jim Sutton. And uh, I'm going to do the hardest thing that I have to do this morning right now when I tell you that he is the senior horticultural display designer. Okay, I did that. It's him. It's, it's good to see you here this morning. And thank you for welcoming somebody who says to plants in the spring, here you are, I'm planting the seed, here's some water, it's up to you now. So. Um, th th that's what you're dealing with here, so I well, just want like you to know. We like to show people what's possible in the world of horticulture. So um, we like to take common plants and elevate them in yeah, unusual yeah, yeah. ways, and also show some unusual specimens that you won't see anywhere else in the world. Well, this just the scene behind me. I mean, it's like a scene out of Shangri-La, Lost Horizons, whatever. It's just so beautiful and lush. And the conservatory is how big? How, how many square feet or whatever? Well, it, we consider it four acres under glass. Four acres under and glass. And it's comprised of 20 different gardens. So some of them are larger, some of them are very smaller, sort of intimate spaces. What you're in now is you're in the main conservatory. And it's a combination between the orangery and the exhibition hall. So the exhibition hall features this sunken, flooded marble floor with the tree ferns. And then, of course, in the orangery, we have this large display of flowering plants. We like to consider it a flower show every day of the year. And it got the term orangery because we have citrus on the lawn. And that's because when the conservatories were built, um, the first part in basically the early 1900s, you would always have citrus because it was so prized out of season. And so for that reason, we still have citrus on the lawn, hence the term orangery for that. But now it's really all about the big floral displays that go on in here. And this conservatory is amazing in winter. I mean, some people wouldn't think perhaps that this place is so amazing in winter. But when you come here in winter, like I think I was here around Christmas time, is it poinsettias or poinsettias? Well, Which one? Let's, let's solve that one. Poinsettia. Poinsettia. Uh, is yeah. their full pronunciation okay. of their, their okay. name. Yeah, yeah. Um, Euphorbia is their Latin name. So yeah. we actually, yeah. in my field, we learn both the common name and the Latin name. And generally in house, we refer to them by their Latin name. So we're all talking about the exact same plant. But it's interesting you mentioned Christmas. Christmas is our single busiest season. We get a tremendous visitation during that time. But we also have four other seasons to round out the year. So our calendar basically goes Christmas, then it goes into orchid extravaganza, which features orchid plants, and that's based on our original collection, and then expanding it to the other houses, and just showing people the divas, we call them, of the plant world, the whole orchid family. The divas. Yeah. Then that goes into our spring bloom season, which is more of a focus on the outdoors. We plant about 240,000 bulbs in the landscape every fall. So it's tulips and daffodils, and they peak in April, usually. So that's more of a focus on the outside. And then that would go into our summer season, which of course the focus on that is the whole outdoor experience, plus our beautiful fountain garden. And then it comes back inside to the focus with our chrysanthemum festival, which actually, truth be told, horticulturally, that's the hardest thing we do. So we're growing, they're not your regular little garden mums. These are big exhibition mums. And then we also grow the largest mum in this hemisphere. It's one chrysanthemum that finishes off about 12 feet wide and 10 feet tall and it, it takes 18 months of continual growth and it's all from one stem. 
and it has over a thousand blooms in it. It's called a thousand bloom style, and it was perfected in Japan, and I can proudly say they're the only people that beat us in size. We, we have the biggest in this, this part of the world. One of the questions I was gonna ask you, and I'll, 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 I'll ask it now since you mentioned Japan, where do you source all of your plants from? I mean, you, you don't go to like the, a little magazine that comes in the mail and say, I'm gonna order that this week. No, no there do. has to be somebody who, yeah. Yeah, we do look at a lot of catalogs for inspiration. You do look at we catalogs. We do look at catalogs, <laughs> but we also do keep a lot of stock plants. Yeah. And we do trade plants between other gardens. Um, it's challenging to get plants in from other countries, but we can bring in seeds without too much problem. Uh -huh. And sometimes we can bring in cuttings from certain countries. So we actually have a very rigorous plant exploration department. So they've been to Vietnam looking for plants. They've been to Europe looking for plants. They're now looking at some countries in Asia for some new plants. So we work with other gardens and we work on finding new plants that the world has not seen. And then we bring them into a botanical setting. We also maintain some things in tissue culture for our own use. And then we maintain stock plants on certain plants that we can't commercially get. When I told people we were coming along with gardens, besides going, oh, you're going there? Besides that, then they'd say, oh yeah, it's a botanical garden. And I said, I don't think so. So wh why isn't this place that looks like a botanical garden, why is it not a botanical garden? Well, uh, in very simple terms, I like to say, a botanical garden saves every plant. They save all the plants for genetic diversity. They'll save every begonia, for example. I like to say, we save the pretty ones. So we are a display garden, so our message is all about beauty. So while we will look at a broad palette of plants, if there's ones that we don't think are eye appealing and something that we can use in our displays, and then it will captivate our guest, we don't use it. So, so this, this place it. is all about snap and show and beauty and that, so this is like the, the Las Vegas of florist. Well, we like to think it's a flower <laughs> show every day of the year. It so it's all planned a year ahead of time. So everything you see is very carefully orchestrated, and it would be a perfect plan if the plants could read. But oh, yeah. they right. can't, so we do every effort possible. Now this is a combination of our whole floriculture team. And floriculture is a term that applies to growing plants for ornamental value. And at Longwood, it's half display and half production. Because our production team, uh, so many of these plants you see here are specially grown at Longwood. We grow about 70% of our plant material. So these are plants you cannot find grown commercially. You were talking about your team. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to me again and to our audience about the training? What training do you have to have before they'll even talk to you about being hired at Longwood? Sure, most of our staff, you're asking about the training of our staff, most of our staff are all university trained. Um, some have come from other gardens, some have come right out of a college setting. Mm -hmm. um, we also run a very vigorous student program but like myself, I have a degree in ornamental horticulture and a minor in business. And then I have um, now 20 years experience working here just at Longwood. So um, a lot of us have come through the industry, but most everybody is university educated. Um, and that would be a degree in what's called ornamental horticulture, or sometimes as a landscape architect, or it could even be in a life science. Um, but we also have other people that support us that you wouldn't expect. Like we have entomology, because we get pests. So we have an entomology department that, that we call it our IPM department, our Integrated Pest Management. But all of those people have degrees in entomology because they understand the insect problems of the plants. So they help us keep these displays looking good by telling us what to treat, when, and how, where, and how. You have your own insect department. We do. Longwood is actually a very complicated place. People come and they see the beauty of it, and they see the mm -hmm. flowers, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. That's what we want them to see. Mm -hmm. But in order to support this, it takes a huge infrastructure. So we have our guest services department, they're the people you'd meet first. We have our performing arts department if you come for an you know, a performance. We have our education department if you're coming for a class. And then of course we have our whole horticulture department. And that's supported by things like the entomology. It's also supported by our facilities that make all this possible. They maintain the structures for us. And we're very fortunate that Longwood has all of these different resources that we can create these displays. Like when you come for Christmas and you see these elaborate displays, yeah. they happen because we have great carpenters, plumbers, electricians, metal shop workers, all on staff, that we can give them a crazy idea and they can help us bring it to life. And then we add the horticulture to it. Well, you have uh, the jazz festival that, that's gone by and, and, and Christmas is, is almost uh, bigger than uh, summer and spring here. It's just, it's just amazing. 
Uh, how many? Do you have any idea how many people walk through the turnstiles uh, sure, during the year? Sure, we get a little year? over a million guests a year. A million guests. Um, and now we do have peak seasons. So Christmas being the biggest one, Christmas we see about 400,000 guests in that six week period of time. Um, but we also want to encourage people to come at the other times of the year because there's always something to see. It is ever changing. You're never going to come in here and see just a bare blank canvas. We're either in the middle of a season or we're planning for the next one or we're in the process of changing over. But we always want to make sure that there's something to engage the guests with. Jim Sutton. I'm not going to do your title again. <laughs> Head horticultural guy right. here at the amazing Longwood Gardens. Thank you so much for sure, talking to pleasure. me. And we're going to we're going to go around here and we're going to see more things and maybe we'll run into you again. You take care. Sure, please come okay. back again. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Well, we came outside now because I wanted to show you the wonderful fountain I have in my backyard. Uh, it's, it's magnificent, isn't it? It's just, just crazy, insane. Uh, Ken Kidrowski is still here at Longwood Gardens where you're on location. And right now my guest is Colvin Randall, who's kind of like the uh, Longwood historian. That's right. I've been here since 1977. 1977. Stud st studying Longwood's history. So, uh, you know, you, uh, you, then you're well-versed in... Uh, what Mr. DuPont did, how he acquired the land, and how it was his private estate, and how he saved the trees, and one thing led to another, and now it's a, uh, a public, uh, I don't know, is it a, what, a, a non-profit organization that draws, what, maybe 50 million people since it was founded? Since, since Longwood opened to the public, which was basically when Mr. DuPont bought it in 1906, we've had more than 50 million. Typically, we get about 1.5 million people a year. Talking to staff members here, they tell me that there are fountain groupies who are practically here every day watching every fountain show. Well, I'm certainly one of those because You're I think I've seen every fountain show in the evening, almost without exception, since about 1973. So uh, I've seen thousands of shows. But yes, especially our members, they will come and now that we have a variety of shows, they want to see all of them. And how long has the I guess you'd say refurbished uh, fountain been uh, been in operation now. It's just been a year. It just opened a year. Uh, Memorial Day area time uh, in uh, 2017. So, in one year, we've we've had a lot of shows and a lot of visitors, and we've learned a lot about what we can do with the fountains. You've learned what you can do. Have you have you have you gone the limit on what what this uh, what this magnificent offering can do? Well, I think, I think it's going to take a few years to do that. There are so many things now that we can do that we haven't really explored everything. Um, there's 8,000 channels. The, the old fountains had like 50 or 60 things that you could do. Now we have 8,000 channels that we can play with for color, for, for fountains, for, for air jets, for flames. It's just amazing. I'm not going to count them all, but how many separate individual discrete fountains do we have here? Well, if we're talking about streams of water in this streams garden, water. they're almost 1,800. 1,800. And they range in size from maybe three feet tall to 175 feet tall. The center fountain that's right in between us here in the background, that one can go, what, 175 that's, feet in the air. That's the tallest, just, yes. Uh, just, just outstanding. And, uh, and uh, I was... Uh, I was asking somebody else earlier if the people who are up there, way up high on, what do you call that, where the, where the, uh, where the, where the fencing or the... Um, it's the, the balustrade the, area. The balustrade area, if, if they're getting wet up there when this is going on. Um, sometimes they do. If the wind is coming from the right direction, they can get misted and you'll hear them screaming, but they seem to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would guess it's kind of like the, the cool off zone. And on a, Especially on a, on a hot, hot day. Summer, on a hot summer day. The ecology fans would like to know how much water is being pumped through there uh, uh, during the shows and even when there's not a show going on. Typically between 30 and 40,000 gallons a minute. And the whole system, in this fountain system, there's almost 600,000 gallons 
uh, which at night goes, most of it goes underground and is treated and then during the daytime it reappears and fills the canals. So through evaporation and some splashing going on, do you have any idea how much water you lose? We've never really, we've never really measured it that way. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly we lose less because it goes underground at right. night. Right. But on a windy day, there is some there is some evaporation or loss, and it goes into the ground and, and kind of completes the cycle. And before the system was redone, the water didn't go underground, right? The old system, everything stayed in the ponds. Everything and, stayed in the ponds. And it would uh, become a little filled with algae and yeah. require perhaps more treatment more than treatment. we have to do now. Yeah, well, there's, there's no way that that water is going to sit around and allow mosquitoes to breed or anything like that. It's constantly moving. And do you have, do you keep some fountains uh, going at night too, just to keep uh, everything flowing? No, at night everything everything, everything shut is, is shut down. But again, most of the water goes underground. Okay. Now, was it 2014 when the old system was shut down? Yes, in the fall of 2014. Okay, so when you, when, and that must have been a major decision to say, we're, we're really gonna bite the bullet now, we're really gonna do this thing. Well, actually the decision was made a couple decades earlier, oh. we started thinking about how we were going to rebuild the fountains back in the uh, late 80s. And so it finally, then after about three years, uh, about 2011, 2012, we started doing intensive planning. And so it was several years of planning and then just two years of construction, two and a half years of construction. Well, you, there was more than a 10 year plan. You, you really had a plan and you went at it um, meticulously, obviously. Yeah, and fountain gardens, in, in all the things that you have historically in gardens, fountains are the first things that deteriorate because there's all this yeah. underground plumbing, sure. whatever, and that's no different here. But now what we've done, we've put everything underground, so everything is in 1,400 feet of tunnels. So in the future, when a repair needs to be made, we won't have to dig it up. We can just go underground and fix it. Somewhere around here, I found, found a price tag wrapped around a a fountain that said 90 million dollars is that about right that's about what it that's cost about what I, I thought that's what the uh, right so that 90 million dollars got plowed back into the uh, economy of this area absolutely um, was it mainly local companies and concerns or some foreign companies and concerns actually um, there were about 94 companies involved and I think it was about 13 states in the, in the United States, and then five uh, foreign countries, Canada, England, France, Italy. Um, so it, it's kind of been a worldwide job. Well, it looks like a worldwide job. I mean, I mean standing here and watching this, uh, one might uh, think that they're uh, at, a, uh, at a palace in France or, or something like that. It's just, uh, it's just awe-inspiring. Uh, and I noticed the people who were here earlier watching the performance. It's uh, it's not just the uh, the more mature individuals who are enjoying the show. The uh, the kids as well. It's a, it's it's really a family affair when they come here to see the uh, the, the, the fountains uh, at, at full at full spray. Yeah, I would I would say so. Especially now we've expanded our musical range. So uh, there's pop music, there's uh, jazz, there's Broadway, there's classical music. There's there's really all types of music when we have a, a musical show to suit all types of tastes. It, it's obviously daylight. If they were to come at night, what, what differences would they see? I mean, well, uh, the lighting, of course. Um, does the different types of music, uh, different types uh, of way the water squirts through the air? Well, it, at, at night, what's amazing is, first of all, there's 1,700 uh, lights that illuminate the stonework. So mm -hmm. it has a kind of a soft glow, uh, sort of a, a warm white color, mm -hmm. and it would be like walking through Rome or Paris at night and seeing all the fountains illuminated. And then the fountains are lit up in white for a period, and then when the show starts, the fountains uh, take on all the colors of the rainbow in a very saturated uh, hues because the, the new LED lighting is very vibrant. So you see stronger colors than you ever would have seen with the old fountains. And there's so many ways you can control it. They can chase, they can flash, they can fade. Uh, it really is the opportunities are endless. Well, you know, I, I, have, I have only about another hour of questions left, but 
uh, Colvin Brandle, it's been a pleasure. I'm so glad you were able to be with here today on, on location. Oh. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you for coming. Okay, great. Thank you.